Hello everyone and welcome to CRAM Surge, clinical research appraisal and methodology for surgical trainees, where we pick a paper fresh from the press on a hot general surgical topic. We review it for you, we present it for you, we critique its methodology for you and provide top of the field expert opinion and teaching on research appraisal and methodology. My name is Gio Perrin and together with Professor Sababala Subramanian and Maria Digby, we bring you Crumb Surge from the wonderful region of the Yorkshire and the Humber. Last time we talked about what systematic reviews and uh, meta-analysis are. We talked about some essential principles. We talked about uh, the processes. And uh, I also had a couple of slides on how you go about searching the literature. So this time, um, I'm going to focus on a few additional concepts that are really important um, in this area. So the first one um, is what we call heterogeneity. So heterogeneity essentially um, it refers to differences between studies. So you can imagine how studies are going to be different in a variety of different ways. And uh, uh, understanding the differences between studies yeah. is quite important. Okay, so I was saying that um, we uh, um, need to talk about heterogeneity in the context of doing a systematic review or meta-analysis. This is a really important concept. And essentially, it refers to differences between studies. And I was um, suggesting that we think of an example. An example um, could be, um, as it shows on the slide, um, a systematic review of studies comparing laparoscopic versus open adrenalectomy. Um, and uh, um, if you say, um, if you consider that you have half a dozen studies, um, each of which is a randomized controlled trial comparing laparoscopic surgery against open surgery, and then you want to look at and the uh, uh, pulling the data from all of these studies and coming to uh, a conclusion about the uh, clinical outcomes following either laparoscopic or open surgery. Let's say that's what you want to do. Now, the first thing to think about is, are there um, clinical differences between these various studies? In other words, is there clinical heterogeneity? Now, you can imagine how um, there could be one study that compares lap versus open surgery in children and another study that compares lap versus open surgery in adults and you can see how the studies are then clinically very different there could be uh, another study that's actually looking at uh, a mixture of lap and robot versus open and you can see how that would be very different to another study that is com simply compared lap versus open and then all the patients in the lap group uh, undergo laparoscopic and uh, not robotic surgery so um, there could be differences in the experience of surgeons uh, involved. So there could be all sorts of clinically important differences between the studies, and those all come under the category of clinical heterogeneity. Uh, the next um, kind of heterogeneity is what we refer to as methodological heterogeneity, where there are differences in uh, study designs and, and differences in the methods employed. There could be an RCT where there's no blinding at all. There could be another RCT where there's blinding in certain aspects of uh, the study design. There could be differences in randomization, and there could be differences in how um, uh, the analysis are done, and so on and so forth. So all of this will come under the category of methodological heterogeneity. And the final uh, type of heterogeneity is what we call statistical heterogeneity, where there could be differences in um, estimates of treatment effect. For example, one RCT could um, show um, you data that says that the length of uh, hospital stay after surgery is much better with laparoscopic arm. And let's assume another RCT actually shows that the length of stay is much uh, uh, low with the open arm for whatever reason. Then you have two different studies coming up with uh, contradictory um, results or the treatment effects being uh, in opposite directions. And that would be a classic example of statistical heterogeneity. So these are the different types of heterogeneity. That's important to keep in mind. Why do we need to assess heterogeneity? Uh, well, um, we need to assess it because if you're going to do a meta-analysis where, you, where you're bringing together the uh, um, effects that you see 
in the different groups across various studies, then we need to ensure that the various studies are homogeneous because otherwise you'd be pulling apples and oranges. And if you do that, then you are prone to making erroneous conclusions. So that is uh, why you really need to assess or look for heterogeneity. Uh, if you're reading a systematic review or if you're yourself doing a systematic review and deciding on whether you're going to do a meta-analysis or not. So um, to assess heterogeneity, again, let's look at the different categories. We said clinical, methodological, and statistical. So for clinical and methodological heterogeneity, uh, you really have to read the individual studies, read the papers um, in detail, and then uh, make an expert assessment. So you look at the population, the intervention, the uh, control group, and the outcomes. You look at the settings. And then you, as an expert surgeon, can decide on whether these studies are heterogeneous or not. Yeah, so that's clinical or methodological heterogeneity. It's a qualitative uh, assessment. For statistical heterogeneity, yes, the assess assessment can be qualitative, and you can look at the treatment effects, and you can look at the effect size and the direction of uh, the effect size. But also, you can look at it um, enumeratively. So you can um, um, you can um, draw forest plots. And you can do some statistical analysis to um, make a more objective assessment of heterogeneity. So when you come across assessment of statistical heterogeneity in meta-analysis, you will find that people talk about the chi-square test for heterogeneity, wherein you do a statistical assessment with the null hypothesis that all of the studies in your review are homogeneous. And then depending on what your chi-square value is and what p-value you get, you then either reject the null hypothesis uh, or uh, you fail to reject the null hypothesis that the studies are homogeneous. Okay, so I hope that makes sense. The other thing to do is to uh, uh, look at the uh, i-square statistic. So um, the I-square statistic, the higher the statistic, the higher is the heterogeneity. So you really want a very low I-square statistic. With the chi-square test for heterogeneity, um, you would um, want a p-value of more than 0 0.05 because if you have a p-value of less than 0 0.05, then you reject the null hypothesis that the studies are homogeneous. Then you have to conclude that the studies are indeed heterogeneous. Okay, so I hope that makes sense. Now, if you have looked at heterogeneity and you've decided that the studies in your review are very heterogeneous, then what do you do? Now, if there is clinical or methodological heterogeneity, then you just don't do a meta-analysis. So that will be uh, the right approach. So you avoid doing a meta-analysis in, uh, uh, in a systematic review where the studies are very heterogeneous. Now, if the studies are uh, relatively homogeneous uh, from the clinical perspective and the methodological perspective. But statistically speaking, if you find that there is significant heterogeneity in that the um, directions of treatment effects are contradictory in that one study says treatment A is better, the other study says treatment B is better, then um, you can either avoid doing a meta-analysis or you can consider, um, you know, there are some options. So there is some flexibility, if you like. The first thing to um, consider is um, subgroup analysis. So you do a subgroup analysis, and I'll explain subgroup analysis in another slide in a bit more detail. But effectively, you could be doing a study that looks, at, you could be doing an analysis that looks possibly just at adults. Um, across the various studies, adults who have had laparoscopic versus open surgery. Uh, and then you can do an analysis looking just, as ch just at children. And by doing subgroup analysis, you may be able to explain the reasons for the statistical heterogeneity. So that is one option. The other option is to analyze in accordance to what we refer to as a random effects model. 
uh, to calculate your summated effect size. So why do we do a meta-analysis? If you remember my previous um, talk, we do a meta-analysis so that, so that you can get to a summated effect size. What is the summary measure taking into account all of the studies in the meta-analysis? And there are different ways of doing this. One is referred to as the random effects modeling, and the other is called the fixed effects modeling. I'll explain that in the next slide. But just keep in mind that if you have statistical heterogeneity and you still want to do a meta-analysis, then consider the random effects model to calculate your summated effect size. And, uh, um, the most important thing, I guess, would be uh, to emphasize that you have to interpret the results with caution. You have to explain in the discussion that the um, uh, effect sizes are quite different in the different studies, and it might even be in opposite directions. And therefore, you have to explain to the reader that the results are uh, to be interpreted with a, a high degree of caution. Okay, so like I said, I'm going to give a really brief introduction to random versus fixed effects modeling. We could probably have an entire session, probably from a more qualified person to talk about this. So I'm going to give you uh, only a very brief intro from a clinical perspective. So the first thing to say is that these are two ways in which you can do a meta-analysis, fixed effects modeling and random effects modeling. Some people will do both and leave it to the reader to decide. Now. If you um, do fixed effects modeling, what that means is that you're assuming that the treatment effects are common or very similar. Whereas if you do random effects modeling, then you're not making any such assumption. Okay, so I hope that uh, makes a little bit of sense. Effectively, whatever um, effect size you, uh, whatever summary effect size you're getting uh, is the weighted average of the study specific effect sizes. So basically you're looking at the effect size across various studies, and you're bringing, pulling them all together. Now, obviously, you want to give different studies different weights because if you have a very large study, then obviously you'd want to give it more weightage. So that's why we say it's a weighted average of study-specific effect sizes. Now, in uh, fixed effects modeling, the weight is the inverse of the variance of study effect size. In other words, um, it refers to, uh, so you give more weight to a study where the effect size is more precise. So what will give you a very precise effect size? What will give you an effect size with very narrow conference intervals? A large um, study. So the sample size is large, then you are more confident with your results. You think that you've got the results with more precision and therefore you give more weight to the study. In a um, random effects modeling, Weight takes into account not only um, the uh, uh, variance or the precision, but also it is dependent on between study variance, what is referred to as heterogeneity. So you take into account not only the sample sizes, but also um, the heterogeneity between studies. When um, you are doing fixed effects modeling, and the inferences you make should be restricted to the population that's included in your systematic review and meta-analysis, right? Uh, but when you're doing random effects modeling, uh, the inferences that you, uh, it, did you make are about the treatment effects in future trials. So you're talking about the distribution of treatment effects. Now, if the heterogeneity is very small, and we're talking about statistical heterogeneity here, then it doesn't matter which model you, you use, both of them will give you similar results or should give you similar results, okay? And you keep in mind that if you're uh, employing a random effects model, which I said is what you should do if there is a, a significant statistical heterogeneity, then um, you have to keep in mind that this gives more weight to small studies and also the results are more conservative. Okay, so I hope that explains a little bit about fixed versus random effects modeling, but I have simplified my explanation quite a bit. Um, so hopefully that's useful. Now let's go on to sensitivity and sub subgroup analysis. So if you're reading a paper uh, on, uh, that essentially incorporates a systematic review and meta-analysis, then you will come across these terms. Now, when you're doing the analysis, 
you will have to be making a lot of decisions about whether to include certain studies or not, or whether to include certain groups of patients or not. For example, we're talking about um, uh, a review of studies comparing lap versus open adrenalectomy. So um, the first question could be, do we include studies where they've got both adults and children in, this, in the um, uh, randomization? along with all the other studies that are primarily on adults. Um, you could then uh, also um, think about uh, whether you ha have to include studies that have got a very poor design, that have not done blinding appropriately, if that's uh, feasible, and so on. You could also think about whether um, you should be including studies that um, include certain patients that are not necessarily present in most studies, like, for example, adrenalectomy in the super obese category of patients. So these are the things that you have to decide upon when you're doing your analysis. And if you um, uh, then say, well, I will do the analysis in different ways with and without including these additional studies or these groups of patients, then you have to see whether your summary findings are independent of these decisions. So effectively, what you've then done is sensitivity analysis, whereby you uh, change the decisions you make with regards to including studies and groups of patients and then you're looking at, at the results and if your results are the same in that the treatment A is better than treatment B or LAP is better than open regardless of these decisions then you say that you've done sensitivity analysis and you still got the same results and therefore the results are much more robust. In other words you're asking the question would repeating the analysis by changing these decisions change the and final conclusions. And that's what is referred to as sensitivity analysis. So I hope that makes some sense. This is a bit different to subgroup analysis. The concepts are similar um, and, uh, um, and you could consider subgroup analysis as a type of sensitivity analysis, but in subgroup analysis, you're producing estimates of the effect size in subgroups. For example, uh, let's go back to the same example of children versus adults. So what you're saying is in children, laparoscopic appendicect uh, adrenalectomy uh, reduces hospital stay by, say, two or three days. So that is a separate effect size that you've got in children. And then you, uh, you calculate a further effect size in adults. And you might say in adult patients, laparoscopic um, adrenalectomy also reduces hospital stay by maybe four days or five days. So what you're doing is uh, in subgroup analysis, you're producing um, your summary effect size for various subgroups. Okay, so I hope that um, is um, clear. I'll then move on to um, a couple of plots you will often see in metalysis. The first is a forest plot and then is a funnel plot. I'll go through, to, through these two and, and then that will be the end of our discussion. So the forest plot, right. So a forest plot is essentially a plot that is used to compare a specific outcome in two different groups, two different groups. You can't have more than two different groups reported on by a number of studies um, and uh, the studies have to be similar. That's important. So the studies shouldn't be clinically heterogeneous or methodologically heterogeneous. And this is usually done as part of a meta-analysis. So if you're not doing a meta-analysis, then, then you're not producing a forest plot. Okay, so that's important to keep in mind. Uh, outcome refers to the occurrence of a disease or, or the effects of an intervention. Uh, and in our example, comparing lap versus open adrenalectomy, one outcome could be uh, length of stay, for example. Another outcome could be readmission rates. Um, the groups um, essentially are the two groups we've discussed in our example. It would be a laparoscopic group and open group. And the studies are usually randomized control trials or observational studies. Typically, you know, in a Cochrane review, you will have randomized control trials. What you don't want to do, or most people say you shouldn't do, is combine randomized control trials and observational studies in the same forest plot. Like you wouldn't want to combine RCTs and observational studies in the same meta-analysis. Okay, so you wouldn't want to do that. Okay, so here's an example of a forest plot. This is what a forest plot uh, usually would uh, look like. Um, uh, this bit 
on the right hand side of the screen uh, in this particular forest plot you've got four different studies and just to explain what we're looking at we're looking at hypocalcemia rate after total thyroidectomy in patients with graves and comparing them with patients without graves disease so um just break this down so you have the studies listed on the left hand side and uh, these could be listed in the chronological order of uh, their publication that's usually what is done then you have the results for the primary outcome for each of the studies in the different groups laid out side by side so in graves patients you have the number of people with hypercalcemia and the non-graves cohort you have the number of people with hypocalcemia and basically you list down all of the um, uh, results just for the primary outcome in these four studies one below the other and then you look at the uh, effect size in this case the effect size is described as the odds ratio so the odds ratio is listed down along with the conference intervals for these four studies and then you've got the forest plot okay so just looking at the forest plot and um, the squares refer to the effect size and the weight of these studies the weight like i said before depends on um uh, sample size usually or some aspect of sample size the horizontal line on either side of the square refers to the conference interval for that particular effect size okay the diamond that you see here refers to the summated effect size which is basically uh, the aggregate of these four effect sizes okay the center of the diamond will be your um, summated effect size and the tips of the diamond would be your 95 percent conference intervals for the summated effect size so the vertical line the vertical solid line refers to the line of no effect so for example if the conference intervals overlap the vertical line then you know that that study has given you a non-significant result in other words the p-value will be more than 0 0.05 for that study so the first two studies here would probably have a p-value of more than 0 0.05 because their conference intervals overlap the line of no effect which is the vertical solid line now the um you could if you want plot a an dotted uh, line like i've shown you here the red dotted line that usually runs through uh, the summated effect size okay so um so that shows you the summated measure like I said before, the edges of the diamond, um, you have to um, look at it and you have to see if it overlaps the line of no effect or not. If it doesn't overlap the line of no effect, then it means that you've got a significant result for the summated effect size. So um, the effect size doesn't necessarily have to be a, an odds ratio. It could be any ratio. It could be an, a, a ratio such as relative risk, or sometimes it can simply be the difference, uh, like the mean difference, uh, in hospital stay for example and the line of no effect is usually at one if it's a ratio which means there's no difference between the groups um, but um, if it is a difference then the line of no effect should be at zero right because you're looking at no difference between groups so the two key questions for you if you're looking at a forest plot are what is the summated measure for that you look at the middle of this diamond the vertical um, dotted red line like i showed in the previous slide and the second question you want to ask is does do the edges of the diamond overlap the line of no effect so those are the two key questions and also uh, keep in mind that the forest plot shows you statistical heterogeneity so in this particular forest plot you can see that all of these squares are on the same side of the line of no effect or on the right hand side so you could argue that there is not much statistical heterogeneity in this uh, meta-analysis okay we're now going on to uh, the funnel plot there's a couple of slides on the funnel plot so essentially uh, one of the problems with uh, meta-analysis is that um, you're only using published data and there are many studies that um, may have been completed but for one reason or the other the studies um, don't get published a common reason you could assume is that studies don't get published if there's no um, obvious treatment uh, difference between two groups um, so there's no obvious difference in outcomes between uh, two treatments 
So these studies um, are often uh, are, are difficult to get published. And um, therefore, you could argue that there could be some quite significant systematic differences between studies that are published and studies that are not published, you know, on the same topic. And this um, causes the phenomenon referred to as publication bias, wherein what you're saying is that the summated measure may not really represent the true effect because studies with negative results don't get published. And therefore, uh, you could argue that uh, what's published is probably an exaggerated uh, estimate of the true effect, right? And um, it could be that, or it could just be that uh, there's delayed publication, um, multiple um, publications that causes um, uh, difference in, uh, in the true effect. And there could be language and citation bias you know, studies published in some uh, languages don't necessarily make it into meta-analysis, which usually often uh, uses English language literature. So one way to assess whether there's publication bias or not is what the funnel plot is all about. Right, so this is an example of the funnel plot. You can see the reference. Um, this uh, I took this picture of the BMJ from 10, 12 years ago. On the x-axis, you have the effect size, the odds ratio, or the relative risk, or the difference. On the y-axis, you have some uh, measure of the precision of the study, which usually relates to sample size. And then you've got this dotted triangle, which covers the area within which 95% of your studies should lie, uh, ideally lie if there's no publication bias. And then you've got this um, vertical line here, which represents the summary measure. So this is the summary uh, measure that you've calculated in your meta-analysis. And each um, of these um, blue dots refer to the individual studies. Now, the solid vertical line is a line of no effect. And it is at one because you're looking at ratios here. For ratios, it's got to be one. For differences, it's got to be zero. So what you're doing is you're looking for symmetry around the vertical dotted line. So if there are a fair number of studies i.e. blue dots on either side of the dotted line, you can say, well, there's no obvious um, problem. There's no obvious publication bias. If there's asymmetry, it could be because of publication bias, or it could be because of differences between studies, heterogeneity that we discussed. It could be because of some problem in reporting uh, and uh, methodological issues. And finally, it could just be pure chance. Now, we tend to, as clinicians, tend to look at this visually and we look for symmetry of the dots around the uh, middle vertical line. Um, and then we probably you know, are reassured that there is not much heterogeneity, uh, sorry, there's not much publication bias. But ideally, um, you ought to um, do statistical testing to see if there's publication bias or not. There are a number of different tests available but uh, clearly that's not something that um, I would be able to explain to you in, in any great detail. I'll leave it to the experts. So, and there's a link there if you want to have a look at. Right, um, we do use uh, funnel plots in surgery when we're comparing the outcomes of different centers or we're comparing the outcomes of different surgeons. And uh, here's a classic example of a funnel plot that looks at a particular complication on the y-axis versus surgeon volume on the x-axis. So each of these little circles represents an individual surgeon. So if you are the individual surgeon and you know which, um, uh, and you know you are represented by a specific circle, you can see where you are in relation to all the other surgeons. Okay, so the funnel plot um, is um, quite often used in the NHS by various surgical societies or uh, by people interested in quality improvement and in uh, identifying outliers in surgical outcomes. And um, they do employ funnel plots quite a lot. That's it. Um, so that's the end. Let me know if you have any questions. Thank you everyone for tuning in and listening. Until next time, keep running your life with our surgical podcast.